the king of podcasts radio network proudly presents the wrestling is real podcast because wrestling needs us here we go episode 654 of the wrestling is real podcast thanks for being here we're going to talk about the WWE way versus the AWA to book wrestling. I think it's just very important that we kind of distinguish things now and where things are in the process of trying to get a, a level head of what's happening here, right? Because we realize that the way things are going right now with wrestling and what AEW is doing and what WWE is doing are completely different stories. So that's what we're working on now. And I think it's very important that we kind of put that kind of context into perspective and just and, let, and just really understand, and really just to explain what WWE is trying to do, the mindset, the thinking they're doing right now when it comes to Survivor Series and the way they're booking it and the way they're promoting it and the way they're, you know, trying to get the build for it and how it's different from what AEW Full Gear did. We saw how Full Gear already so far, 145,000 buys for the weekend. So it's considerably really good. People really bought it. They were really interested in it. And people were really, really, it was a lot of response for it. Survivor Series doesn't have anything close to the build that Full Gear had, nor the level of build of matches or storylines. They have not bothered to do that here. But what people need to understand is this is where I'm talking about the lack of the IWC influence because WWE is ignoring the internet wrestling community. Now that doesn't matter what they tell what, what internet wrestling, you know, podcasters, people like me, it doesn't matter what we say to them about our disdain our dislike of what they're doing with the format about all the releases of talent that they've done so far. Because the truth is, there are a lot of loyal, diehard WWE fans that do not want to go ahead and look at another alternative product because they're going to look down on it. That's well, that's why you have your loyal WWE fans, which are not many. It's a vocal minority that has continued to dwindle down year after year since the 90s, since the Monday Night Wars. You had a good, large gathering, and that has just been whittled down, whittled down, whittled down. A, because of the cable, the decline of cable. B, because of the rise of social media and the internet. And C, because the product's gotten progressively worse. That makes the storm of all that. But the thing is, WWE is not considering to bring those fans back. They're trying to replace the IWC that's been around because they know partly that a lot of you guys are, a lot of you fans are going to stick around and still watch the product and still watch just to complain about it because you still want to see what happens. You still have invested interest in a lot of stars here. And there are a certain number of things when it comes to WrestleMania or SummerSlam and some of the bigger events that you're still emotionally invested in. Plus, all the years you spent watching the product, appreciating what they've given to you in the past, and feeling like, well, this is where I, I put all my time into this. I'm not just going to give up on it. Because some people just don't want to give up wrestling or watching sports entertainment. So they're not going to do that. They don't want to do that. They don't want to get to that point. So what's happening is I think is that Nick Khan and the team there they're going a different approach and they want to go to a more mainstream approach of promoting. So what they've done this time around for Survivor Series, instead of doing any conventional by the book, Vince's way of booking, promoting, and storytelling, if any, of any of these matches, doing the Raw versus SmackDown dynamic, when we know that draft just happened about a month and a half ago. And now we're at the point where a little over a month ago. So now all those changes of the draft finally were instituted after Crown Jewel. And now here we are for Survivor Series four weeks later. And the fact that we didn't get the normal, oh, the kind of break up the can Survivor Series teams coexist, any kind of back and forth banter between the champions on 
separate brands and coming together to do super shows or even having some of the NXT talent come in and intervene. Well, none of that's happened right now. We've seen that many times before. So why are we going to go through this again? Like we do every year. Because sure, we've had the matches where Charlotte and Becky have faced each other. We've never had Biggie and Roman Reigns face each other. Okay. But are you going to get much mileage out of those things? Charlotte and Becky is the one feud they've kind of built up for Survivor Series nonchalantly, but really they haven't done so much where they've talked to each other in the ring, except for that title switch, a title exchange. Other than that, they did nothing else. So there's that part because the title exchange really just meant more about the thing for Bianca Belair and Sasha Banks individually for what they were going to do. But the part with Charlotte, this would be something they could always go back to and fall on for Survivor Series. When it comes to Biggie and Roman Reigns, they talk from afar. And instead of Roman Reigns coming in really to confront, they've done the storyline where it's the New Day who are over on the SmackDown brand and the attacks on them. So the bloodline of the New Day have been the ultimate storyline for that. And then we're going to get Biggie and Roman Reigns. But Biggie has not been the focus at all except when he's trying to talk and try to confront Roman Reigns. And then this pe- this past week on Raw, he's sending a message by attacking the Usos and having one of them down afterwards and saying, send a message to your brother or to your, uh, to your tribal chief, right? That's what they did. That's all the bill they did for that. Nothing for Shinsuke Nakamura and Damian Priest. And that's it, right? They're being... The tag titles, I don't think we're going to see anything of that. I don't know if the Usos are taking on, uh, who is it, AJ Styles and Omos? No. Well, who's the title? Oh, and yeah, I guess we are getting RK Bro and uh, Usos. But other than that, we saw some of that already brought in together. And the Survivor Series matches, not much. Because remember, while they were doing this, what they were really doing on TV is they were just furthering storylines down the line, which is what Brian Alvarez at Wrestling Goes River Radio had said. They're not even booking for Survivor Series on TV. They're just doing TV storylines leading to future matches. So Big E, Seth Rollins is the set program after this match of Survivor Series with Roman Reigns. For Charlotte, I'm guessing what? Are we going to get... Well, she's just been getting certain opponents anyway. First, she had Shotzi. And now she has Tony Storm that's looking to go ahead and confront. And as for, as for Becky Lynch, she has Liv Morgan. So they're already moving ahead. Like there's nothing, there are no ramifications that come about as a result of Survivor Series. There is no outcome at Survivor Series that's going to make anything. This is like an Impact Plus pay-per-view where nothing of news actually happens. But we get some good matches. We get some good confrontations. And, you know, it'll be live. So we have that going for us. So we'll get a good show to watch. But for people that were looking for like a traditional build for this show to be treated like the number four show that it's supposed that we've always thought it to be, well, they didn't do it this time because they're trying a different approach. This time around, you see quite a few interviews being done with, say, Charlotte Flair, who's made the run on TV or The Miz. And now we have late night appearances for Roman Reigns and a number of stars on uh, free, first of Roman Reigns going on Jimmy Fallon's Tonight Show. And then late night with Stephen Colbert, you have WWE stars going there, which is like the Big E, Sasha Banks. I think Becky Lynch is part of that. I forget who else. So they're doing the mainstream press tour to get the word out about Survivor Series, which is going after a mainstream audience. And then they're doing their social media by promoting the matches on social media, having them announced on social on their social media platforms first. And then taking that as news that will be broken on television. So it's the other way around, which it actually should be now these days where you want things to be noticed on social media to grab the attention of the fans, whether it's going to be because remember, the fans that are going to be following social media are your diehard, loyal WWE, WWE fans for the most part. Maybe not every social media platform, but at least for me, I know I follow them on Twitter. And I follow them on TikTok. Otherwise, I don't follow them on Facebook or Instagram or anything else. No. So it's just Twitter and TikTok. 
I don't even follow the YouTube channel. No. So you have all those different social media sources. And so then you're also, when people are waiting for the TV show, they're not going to wait for the live TV show to come on or to cast a rerun. They're going to find all the information they want right then and there. And it goes out to everybody, including the global audience that will be tuning in. And that's what they're going to get. Remember, they're also not selling a pay-per-view unlike AEW that was charging $59 for or $54, I think it was, for that pay-per-view. Like for AEW, they're trying to get 145,000 buys at 55 bucks a pop. So they're trying to make that plus the gate and really put some money in. For WWE, it's kind of guaranteed money. They know what their subscriber base is. They know what their cut is going to be from Peacock. And they know they're going to make either $4.99 or $9.99 based on the subscription plan that said the WWE fan has. And that's it. With very rare... uh, exclude exceptions for those that actually are buying a traditional pay-per-view which i guess is still in some cases is still available so you have those different approaches so instead of getting the normal pay-per-view built what the WWE did instead was for survivor series because they didn't get any marquee matches that were going to be where people thought maybe the rock and roman reigns are going to face each other that was actually going to happen no if they did have that match and it was available well, I don't think it would have been a right thing to go ahead and put them on, put the Rock and Roman Reigns on Survivor Series. That would be a WrestleMania match. But then what they're going to do is Survivor SummerSlam. They absolutely built to storylines. They built to book matches ahead of time. Maybe they might not have announced the matches ahead of time, but maybe that's something they're going to be doing in the future, where they'll just they won't even do the whole I'm going to face you at SummerSlam. They're not even going to do that anymore. They might not even bother to do that anymore. Like they'll announce the matches and then there's, you know, the talk about it. And then we have contract signings or, hey, face-to-face confrontations or whatever formulaic thing that the company decides to do. So they'll go with that and done. But this is the WWE way going forward. I think they're going to go with mainstream press. They're going to try to go through their mainstream outlets, their relationships with Fox, their relationships with NBC Universal where they could go on to USA Network and do something. They could go on to the Today Show on NBC or the Tonight Show, or they can go on the Late Show with Stephen Colbert, or they can just go the route and the publicity team at WWE, which is you know these people from CAA that are being brought on board from Nick Khan, they're saying, hey, make the phone calls, get our stars on their shows. So you want to get them on Kelly Clarkson, you want to get them on, you know, uh, pick a show. You want to get them on the bump. You want to get them on this podcast. You want to get them on Pat McAfee. You want to get somebody on, what is it, uh, Sam Roberts. You want to get somebody over on Peter Rosenberg's show. All that. So then you can have, you know, you can even have them like maybe going on Barstool. You can have them going on ESPN. You can have them going on Fox Sports. That's the direction that WWE wants to do. That is what they're trying to do. And I think a lot of the fans don't understand that. And they can't comprehend why are they doing it this way? Because this is the way in the world where Nick Khan lives, when he has promoted his own talent under creative artists agency, when he wanted to get Colin Cowherd or Pat McAfee or other people were in the sports broadcasting fold and get them on the different shows and promote their careers or promote athletes in that matter or promote events. This is what they would do. This would be like the PR, advertising arm, marketing arm, all combined. The full court press of getting press, publicity. And then what happens is Survivor Series would get the promotion, not just from the normal WWE machine, that's only going to get out so far. What they're trying to do is exponentiate. They're trying to get a bigger signal out there and get more people talking about it that are not your run-of-the-mill loyal WWE fans. That's what they're not going to do. They're not going to worry about that anymore. What they want to do is they want to move forward and say, okay, let's see if we can get Stephen Colbert, Jimmy Fallon, all these different podcasters, all these different radio shows. We're going to get all these people to talk about. It's just like, it's kind of like the idea of how you would have stars promote a live show coming into your town. Except for this, we're promoting events. It's the same way UFC would promote an event coming up or say like Logan Paul or Jake Paul. If they're, you know, promoting some boxing event, 
one of their exhibition boxing events and they do the thing where they go ahead and put that out there. That's what they would do. And then you would make availability for all your stars to do press. They already do some of that already, but now they're doing it more than ever. And that's the way they promote. And then they use social media to promote. Because if you look at what they're doing now, that's what, that's what I think they feel like is working for them. And the negative press by all the fans out there that are saying, oh, well, look what's going on here. They're neglecting the whole show. They're not even like paying attention to the show like they normally would. Well, they're doing more. I mean, they're doing more promoting for themselves and they're putting out pretty solid content when it comes to promoting everything because Survivor Series is just one piece of the puzzle. When you look at their Twitter feed just alone, you can see clips from Raw and SmackDown. You see some memes out there. You see promotion for WrestleMania 38, which has already started. Like you're seeing promos on TV. You're seeing promos on their social media feeds where Stone Cold's talking about it. Then you have NXT War Games being set up. They're promoting that. And then Survivor Series, you just have different cards up there showing them about the matches that are going to be featured and what's going to be going on there. And they're consistently doing things like that. So like tonight, a couple hours ago, they're showing Paul Heyman and they retweeted Paul Heyman talking about he's going to be going on the Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon as I record this tonight. So he would have already been on as I record this. So you got that. And then, like I said, Late Show with Stephen Colbert tonight on a Thursday night, by the way, the most popular night that you want to be able to promote something for the weekend, Bianca Belair, who was actually featured as she was at, uh, I think it was at a Staples Center for an LA Lakers game, I think it was. And she's going to be on Late Show with Stephen Colbert among the others that are there. So you have the superstars using their own platforms to promote and WWE is piggybacking off of them. And that's what they're doing. They're all doing that. Street Profits are going to be on there. They're all doing this thing right here to kind of just continue to promote all of this. So they're going to go around and say this. That's the plan. They don't have to go through the normal where the TV is the end all be all route to promote the show. You're going to have only 1.5 to 2 million viewers that are going to watch that show with probably a handful that are going to be watching on demand or the ones that will be following on the social media feeds, because we know that if you look at the social media audience, they already have. And if any one of these different things on their feed pops up, they got 11 million followers on Twitter. I forget how much they have on YouTube, but YouTube, they got billions of followers on there. They just have their ways of promoting things like they want to, because you know, the digital team they have there, they're not working on movies. They're not working on other programming like they were so much of the network because remember the network doesn't have as many documentaries as much shows as they were doing before so now you consolidate which is what Nick Khan did you consolidated the whole digital division and all those people that are around for WWE Network are gone and now you just have people that are working on the digital side the social media side the website portion they're the ones that produce the bump they're the ones that you know they'll work on repurposing some of the TV content whether it's talking smack or you know raw talk or whatever there might be and they're working their way around of that so this is just being smart on their end is it what you like no a lot of you fans probably don't like the way they're doing this but you do know that survivor series is this sunday believe it or not you already know that you know the matches because of the fact you didn't know the matches before specifically, like you didn't get the announcement as to what the matches were going to be. You didn't get that normal, like four week build to something. Is that really making a difference? I mean, do you really feel like there's anything there that makes you feel like, wow, this is like, I'm really excited for this. You got the same amount of excitement you were going to get anyway. And they've already booked the pay-per-view and all they had to do was what we're doing. Raw versus SmackDown. You know, that's it. And there was nothing they were going to do at all on television, Raw or SmackDown, to make you excited for either Survivor Series match, number one, for, I mean, you already know the built-in when it comes to and the champion versus champion matches. So Charlotte and Becky, that's a no-brainer. You know, I actually wouldn't be surprised if they put that more to the end of the night 
but they probably won't because they'll probably have Roman Reigns close the night out on Survivor Series. So Biggie Roman Reigns, it's an interesting match, but we know that Biggie's not going to win. Becky Lynch, Charlotte Flair, that's a total toss up. I couldn't tell you who could win that match. And remember that there's no title being lost. Even though Charlotte did put that across, why don't we put the titles on the line? I wish they would have done that. Consolidate one belt, but they're not going to do that. We know they were going to get good matches. Like what they have, Survivor Series matches, those are going to be fun, entertaining to watch. Like just the the card alone should be enough to make it a B plus pay-per-view. Now, what can they do to make it an A? That's it. Look, we know that the card is going to be good. I mean, Barclays, just because we're not getting anything that will really matter after Survivor Series, because Survivor Series is really just a standalone show. It's just static. There is nothing that really, if there's anything that does progress towards storylines, it will be within what they have now of the matches. So for Team Raw, Team SmackDown, you can see where Happy Corbin is in there. And there's some interaction with him, say with Drew McIntyre. There's a lot of that kind of stuff there. Plus, of previous feuds there might have been out there where Drew McIntyre and Bobby Lashley will definitely have their war of words, where Seth Rollins could have his war of words with, say, like, I don't know, uh, a King Woods or, you know, I mean, there's going to be obviously some fusion, some friction, excuse me, between the teams and the teams are going up against. And they can also tell stories that will lead into storylines after the fact. That could lead into something because obviously Seth Rollins, Kevin Owens, Bobby Lashley, you could see where it can be some animosity because there's a lot of heels in that group. And for Finn Balor being one of the few faces, he's the only face. I mean, I guess Kevin Owens, no, Kevin Owens is a heel. So you got four heels and a face on the Raw side. And then you have, at the moment, four faces, right? You got, no, three faces and two heels, most likely. We might have four faces on the SmackDown side. So the dynamic is interesting. When you look on the Team Raw and Team SmackDown side, same thing here. You have some stars that are definitely like buckling with each other. You could build storylines within the Survivor Series elimination matches themselves to lead into something. At least it would spurn something out of that. You could spawn something out of that. But then the champion versus champion matches? No, not at all. I mean, I don't think we're getting any kind of disqualifications or plunder. I don't. Now, we might get some storylines that come out of any DQs or any kind of plunder for a match that happens. Where anywhere where, say, Becky Lynch or Charlotte Flair, they decide to go to a, no, a, a, a DQ or Biggie and Roman Reigns, they never give us a winner. Like, they could do that, too. I mean, to me, I think Demi Priest, Shinsuke Nakamura, Shinsuke Nakamura, the tag title match with RK Bro and the Usos, Biggie and Roman Reigns, I think we're absolutely going to get a winner out of those matches. But I can see Becky and Charlotte become a DQ finish, and then we'll have whoever becomes a lone survivor on the men's and women's side of the Survivor Series matches. But that's what they're going to do. Now, I want to take a story from Deadspin that has really gone after talking about how Survivor Series sucks. And even the wrestlers don't even care about this show. So I'll take this story from Sam Fells that describes here and take it from there and put my own spin on what he's saying. So, The anchor of the season for the matter that we always had these big four pay-per-views is Survivor Series, which takes place Sunday. So the build for last year was borderline nonsensical and definitely a waste of time. And that, according to the story, he's saying that it appears that even the wrestlers themselves have gotten so bored or confused by the whole thing they haven't even hesitated to say so. Becky Lynch had an interview with Vincente Beltran about the lack of payoff or any reason of any of this happening. Quote, yeah, I mean, that would be helpful. The whole brand supremacy is a little outdated, but at the same time, we're all competitors and you always want to be the best and whatever it is, whatever carrot they dangle, you always want to be the best. Whether it's here, the winner gets a freaking banana. Like, well, I want that freaking banana. I want to pr- prove I deserve that banana. So you always want to be the best. So I think whatever the logic is, you can make it work, whether you're a competitive human, which we all are. You don't get to WWE if you're not competitive. Okay. So it's still, it's it's the point of competition. 
seeing a winner and a loser, it's just like if you're watching boxing. We might not have a whole emotionally vested interest in who wins, but you know we're here to see a fight and who wins the fight. So we'll watch the matches, and maybe they're not going to have a storyline behind it because this particular pay-per-view doesn't warrant it. Like I said, it's just a glorified bragging rights pay-per-view. Xavier Woods also put his point. He says, the losing team Raw obviously should have a five-way elimination match fighting for spots one through five in next year's Royal Rumble, uh, the idea of th- that Woods put forward. In turn, the winning team, who he believes will be Team SmackDown, would have a five-way elimination match at some point after the show to determine spots 26 through 30 in the 2022 Royal Rumble. No. That's a nice fantasy booking thought, and that would be kind of cool, but to go ahead and already set up 10 of the spots going into the Royal Rumble takes away some of the surprise. I mean, that's part of where we are is to actually know who's going to have those spots. That's the problem. That would probably be the bad part, but I, but I get exactly what he's trying to do and it does make sense. Maybe there's a way to do that a different way, but also if you do that, it's kind of like, well, the only time they ever really like don't remember something that they need to go ahead and put as part of a cash in is it's not where people land on the Royal Rumble. It's the fact that who wins the Royal Rumble and that they're going to get a championship match at WrestleMania. And then those money in the bank cash in, you always know that person's going to be reminded that they have a briefcase that could cash in at any time. So that's how you always know of storylines because they always kind of give you like, you know, certain symbols that let you know about to remind you that somebody has a cash in ready to go. Whether they're going to talk about it through promos leading up to WrestleMania or you're going to see a money to make briefcase in their hand as they come out all the time. Now, he says the brand supremacy actually matters in this scenario because one brand is getting the sweetheart rumble spots while the other is getting the absolute worst. Okay. So Sam Fels moves along and says that Survivor Series suffers from the same issue that so much of the WWE booking does, which is if they show no inclination to care about it, why should we care to watch it? So they announced the teams on Twitter a couple weeks ago. Then shows in the interim have changed those teams for reasons no one can figure out. So we know that at the moment we don't we don't know the complete Survivor Series women's team, and we don't know the complete. Oh no, we know the Raw team now for the men's side, where they've added Austin Theory in replacement of first Dominic Mysterio and then Rey Mysterio. So they did that part. And then they talk about how Adam Pearce being used in the mix and how he and Sylvia Deville have been working as GMs across both shows for months now and how they're both also working as heels because, as always, a heel authority figure, that's just the de facto position that any authority figure has to be on WWE programming. If it's not a de facto heel authority figure, it could be a laptop. We don't, go back, we don't want to go back to that again, the anonymous Raw General Manager. So those two stories right there do spring up a lot. But what do we have next? Now, the AW side. I mean, I'm looking at dark. I'm looking at elevation. There are matches sometimes that lead up to glorified squash matches, but lead to certain matches that would be led towards the pay-per-view. Every, like, you know, five, ten minutes, Excalibur is plugging full gear. They're giving out the full card. They've booked matches so far ahead. And you know what matches are going to be booked up up until right about the end. And they were they had tournaments leading up to the TBS tournament, the world title and eliminator tournament. And then you had all the constant build when it comes to the rankings. And you know eventually who's going to be booked for matches going down the line. And certain feuds being booked because MGF Darby Allen had a lot of build going you know back a month and a half more than that when you're talking about eddie kingston cm punk it might have been a shorter ramp to get that started but when they did it got hot and they really built to it same thing with lucha brothers and ftr they've had a lot of back and forth when it comes to matches and ftr winning the triple a tag team belts off of lucha brothers the cost of story with kenny omega or the young bucks or adam cole with jungle boy Christian Cage, Luchasaurus, and Hangman Adam Page and his chase for the world title, which culminated at full gear. 
And then you have the women's issue where you have Britt Baker, Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, going up with Ty Conti and the build for that. And Ty Conti kept getting built up, built up, built up through dark and elevation up to the point of her getting the ranking that she did. Because remember, the, the AEW way, and I said this on, I don't know if I said this on Full Gear or not, but I think I did point it on the Full Gear recap, which you can listen to over at WrestlingIsReal.com. I mentioned how important now that the records are starting to become. Because if you look at the records of certain stars, the main stars, when it comes to your main eventers, when it comes to the title holders, they all have great records of less than a couple of losses or they're undefeated. And then you look at stars like, okay, like Ty Conti, I think when she was like, might have had either four or five or six losses, but she had wrestled so many times because then you have certain stars that their records are padded really well because they have a lot of matches under their belt because they've been wrestling dark and elevation this whole time. So all those matches they had on dark and elevation matter towards the ultimate goal of bringing them up in the rankings and building up their win streaks so they become more relevant and there's more reputation behind them where, man, these people are on a roll. And so like if MJF has never lost a match, then you could absolutely say, well, well, there's one right there. And then you could say the same thing for, you know, whatever, like even Dark Order. If you see all those stars there, you know, they might lose sometimes on Dynamite or Rampage, but they're always winning squash matches on Dark and Elevation. That's how this works. It's an old school format. So like when you think about the records, if it mattered in WWE back in the 80s and they had all those squash matches, either primetime wrestling or superstars or all American challenge, then you would know that, you know, Savage would have a big record coming into a match or Steamboat or Hogan or, you know, whatever. Like you would know Hogan had an undefeated streak anyway or would be unbeaten so far getting up to, you know, his run as world champion from the Iron Sheik winning in 84 all the way to, you know, like around 90 when he dropped the belt. So you have that going for you. And then you just say to yourself, AEW has a format where the wins and losses matter. And then the, what they set up with the matches, you're building the stars to a certain point where they all matter. Like, I mean, you're not seeing stars like you would in WWE where, you know, they take a loss early on or they start losing kind of consistently. Because think about when you have some of the stars that were released, right? Malachi Black or Andrade didn't have great records. If you looked at what their records were coming out of WWE because they were taking losses from other stars above them. But another thing was that they were not getting any squash matches to kind of pad their record to bring their win-loss record up because they don't have those matches. This is why the old school format that Tony Khan's following along with where you have win loss records and you're using dark and elevation and you've made those shows matter. Now it's a great way to do it. Like, yeah, you're not going to get that big of an audience for you too, but you know, you're getting sometimes what 150, 150,000 after the first couple days of the show. And you might get 40, 50,000 maybe watching the show live at seven o'clock on Monday and Tuesday nights. But with all that, people are falling back up to watch the matches. They might be just quick squash matches, just bang, 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 and they're going through them. But what they're doing is you're getting a lot of feature stars that you want to see. So like Hikaru Shida, you don't, and we saw her tonight on uh, Dynamite, but you know what? If you haven't seen a lot of her or Serena Deeb and that storyline, well, you know what? You should have been watching Dark and Elevation because they've been following that over there and on Rampage. So Hikaru Shida always wrestling on those shows. You want to watch Riho? She's always on those shows. You want to catch, uh, you like catch you watch uh, The Bunny or Anna J or Ty Conti or Ruby Soho is always wrestling on the show. Dark Order, always on Dark and Dark Elevation. Matt Hardy's always on there. The Best Friends are always on there. And then all these other stars that even started from the beginning, like the Sunny Kisses, the Joey Janelles, the Peter Avalons, the Wingmen, you know, the Nightmare, Nightmare Family, all these other people. And the other thing, too, is that they don't even have set jobbers necessarily. They have a couple of stars that are just set jobbers, and they have bad records. Like Peter Avalon, I saw on Dark last night, and he had a record of 88, 40, and 2. It's just a horrible record. But the idea is you're seeing these matches going on, and every match matters to the longer effect of what's going on. The part WCW doesn't do. 
but this is where it's traditional wrestling booking and they're actually caring about the records more than anybody else ever did because i don't know of any promotion that really was this stickly about rankings and records like you remember you had a point where impact wrestling would kind of go on and off with that under bischoff and hogan or even wcw would try to do a little bit something like that but it was always like a stop and start like would it would it actually hold up if we did it like it's throw it on the wall see if it sticks and it never did for aw from the beginning they said no we're going to do this but this is why the system works now, the only thing that AEW has to worry about is they can build to a certain ceiling of fans that are the fans that have been disenfranchised, the ones that are upset, that are not happy to see what happened to these former WWE stars or to the wrestling they enjoyed on WWE itself. So some of them might actually go ahead and make the switch over to watch AEW eventually because now you've gotten to the point where all these former WWE stars continue to keep going over or other organizations. So now we might have a few more Ring of Honor stars. Like we got Jay Lethal coming in tonight. He went up against Sammy Guevara, but you know what's going to happen with Jay Lethal? He might have had his first loss tonight on Dynamite, but he'll be on Dark. He'll be on Elevation. He'll be on Rampage. He might get some matches that will help enhance and showcase his skills. Because remember the other thing too, in all those squash matches, you don't have them go very long. There might be like two, three, four minutes at a time. But then you're getting to see all the moveset of the stars that you like out there and their finishes and their entrances, and it's all coming into play. So you get the whole experience of the stars you like out there. And I think for some of these stars, I think it feels better. Like when I see Andrade Idolo on the on Dark or Dark Elevation, which I think he wrestled on both shows this week. Ruby Soho wrestled on both shows this week. And for me, I like it because, you know, Andrade's got a great entrance. Ruby's got a great entrance. The work rate's great. You know they're going to be great out there, and they get some stars that are not that big a deal. And, of course, there's some younger stars. They're, they're kind of working the in the in the ranks, but that's the early initial the start of Dark and Dark Elevation is they did that. Those shows matter. Meanwhile, WWE doesn't offer a place unless you're watching main event. And who's watching main event on Peacock? And they don't have a superstars, which superstars kind of fit that place too. But, you know, you wouldn't watch main event and superstars and eventually see matches that would count towards the main roster where what happened on main event actually benefited the stars to become something bigger on the main roster, unless they've been around for a while. But we always know that with superstars and with main event, the way they were always booked, or even Saturday morning slam when they had it for a while, it was all mid cards. And mid-cards whose records didn't make much of a difference because they wouldn't be on there over and over and over getting win after win after win. Instead, they were getting parody booked like they were on the main roster. So you're getting even Steven booking. That doesn't work. It's been proven time and time again. But WWE doesn't matter because they want the product. They're not worried about the stars to be built up for AEW to get people to go to their shows, they need all these talents on the marquee to be featured. They're coming to see CM Punk. They're coming to see Brian Danielson. They're coming to see Inner Circle, right? They're coming to see the Super Click, the Bucks, Adam Cole. They're coming to see them. They're coming to see Andrade El Idolo. They're coming to see Dr. Britt Baker. They're coming to see MJF. So it's not AEW as a full brand, because if that was the case, Universal Studios would be packed to the hilt with, with, uh, with what they're doing over there. Or people would go ahead and pack the rafters as soon as Dark and Dark Elevation started an hour before bell time. Well, that's not the case here. You do get good crowds that are showing up anyway. But that's what we're talking about. Does that make sense? In other words... What AEW is doing full time in all their programming goes towards the bigger goal. Okay. It's for the ultimate goal of building stars, developing talent, and creating stars out of who they have, elevating stars that are pre ages that are being brought into the fold. Because as they talk about the four pillars, right? If you're talking about Darby Allen, MJF, Jungle Boy.
and Sammy Guevara, all those stars, you notice, they probably, they probably have really good win-loss records. I mean, we know that's for the most part of all of them because even right now, I'm trying to think about, okay, of one of the stars that I know that we've seen on TV, if I wanted to look at the record for him right now, at the moment, it's I'm looking at it and it says that he has an overall record, either in tag or whatnot, 50 and 18. His singles record is 37 and 13. And so if I look at, okay, there's one site, awresults.com, that really kind of falls along with this as well. And I can look at his win-loss records. At the moment, he has, as a single star, 36 wins, 10 losses, one draw. Overall, he's at 49 wins and 15 losses. And there you go. And then looking at a Darby Allen, and this is a great site, but awresults.com, his 2021 record is 28 and 4. So remember, they always kind of reset the records. So you can look at the overall record for somebody, but then you look at the 2021 record and what he's done. This is why Darby Allen is a star now because he rarely loses. He's been brought up with Sting. They've done a lot of things to help build that star power of Darby Allen. That's why this guy gets a pop now every time he comes out. Let me give you another one. This is a great way to kind of really explain things. Let's go with Sammy Guevara. When you look at his information, his 2021 record is 12 and four. And then overall, his record has been 21, 14, 24 wins, 21 wins, 14 losses or 32 and 24. So initially he was given more or less a 500 record in his first couple of years. But then this year becoming TNT champion, 12 and four, he's made a bigger deal. And remember, if you look at their matches, you have him going on Dynamite, Dark, Elevation. And even in this AEW results site, they talk about how he has a six-match win streak. And, you know, that's been him consistently winning with the TNT title. It's not where you have those non-title matches with certain WWE stars that are title holders, like a Damian Priest. And you're saying, oh, well, this guy keeps losing. Or Big E keeps losing non-title matches as he's WWE champion. Meanwhile, Roman Reigns, when he's champion, he hasn't lost when he's held down to that belt. And he's held the belt now 444 days. So I think he already beat CM Punk's record of, no, it's coming up on CM Punk's record for the longest title reign in the modern era. So you got that going for you. And then you look at, say, like a Bobby Lashley when he held the record. And you look at what he's been doing, but now they've been giving him losses. And Drew McIntyre has also gotten losses. So, I mean, they haven't taken as much many losses as much to kind of bury them down but like if you say like you look at kevin owens or seth rollins or Sami Zayn or baron corbin or happy corbin and you look at some of the stars here like a ring mysterio as well they're all in the middle of the pack and they're probably at like sub 500 records and so it doesn't matter because if we see them going after the world title or they're going after a title probably might be a chance they're not going to win because we don't believe they're going to win like if you were a betting person you wouldn't even bet that they're going to win right so you think about it like that. Let's go to some other names. Let's go to Adam Page. Another great example that really kind of explains everything here. So go to Adam Page's section. I can look at under AW archives or AW results, excuse me. And for him, his work in wrestling, he's had 49 dynamite. Now, here's the other part. We're seeing all these matches on TV. Now, maybe some of the stars I'm talking about, they're winning on house shows, but they don't count and nobody gets to see them except for the foes in the crowd. But we're not seeing it on television, the constant domination of how well they're doing. So we don't know about that. And there's parody booking at house shows as well. So Adam Page, for instance, given that he is now AW World Champion, his record is 17 and 2. That's overall 2021. As a single star, 12 and 1. As a tag team partner, 4 0. And 1 and 1 as part of a like a trios or a four or like an eight man tag or a 10 man tag, whatever it is. So you got that. And then what is it? From 27 matches, he is, he wrestled on Dynamite, he wrestled on Elevation, he had six pay per view matches and things like that. Right? If I look at MJF, another great example of where things are. 
here's MJF's record, which we already know. Now that he's going to take on CM Punk, we know that his record has been pretty good with very few blemishes as well. And his whole career right now, it looks like overall 32 wins, six losses for his entire career in AEW. His 2021 record, 11 wins, three losses. As a single star, five and one. Tag team, three and one. In a group, three and one. This guy doesn't lose much. And the only difference with him is that he only wrestles on Dynamite. He doesn't even wrestle on Rampage. And he's had four pay-per-view matches. Like that's, that's booking strong. And then let's look at Jungle Boy, which is the other name that was the four pillars that we want to make up and showing the importance of him. At Jungle Boy's record, he's wrestled a lot of matches. Now, overall, he has 70 wins and 31 losses in his career in AEW. In 2021, 34 and 15. Now, his singles record when he's wrestled alone, 16 and 3, 13 and 3 in tag team matches, 2 and 2, 2 and 2 in trios, and when he's been in group matches, he's lost more than he's won. And then if you look at his record on matches, he's done matches on Dynamite, Rampage, Dark, and Elevation. It's what works. Now, let me look at the other side of the coin. Let's look at some of the stars been brought in from the free agent side. Let's look at, first of all, oh, let me think, Eddie Kings is another example. I could go through this all night. And I should go along and talk about this in the future shows, especially when we're getting kind of worn down on like what there's going to be going to talk about when we get to the end of the year. It's probably a good thing to go to as well. Eddie Kingston's record, 27 and nine this year, 12 and five as a single star, 11 and two in tag, four and two in trios. And when you look at his, he has worked dynamite, dark, elevation, house shows, pay-per-views, all of that. So they got that part. Now let's go into some of the stars, like I said, that have been working now and they were part of, and you look at the difference on how they're being booked now. now. Even Lance Archer, we haven't seen him in a while, but you know, that guy's been booked strong and they haven't even used him that much. His record overall, 37 and five, or should be 41 and eight overall single star, 37 and five in his whole career in AEW. 2021 record is 26 and eight. And that's where he had losses when he was part of a group, and in tag team matches, and 25-4 as a single star. And, you know, those stars, the matches he lost were in pretty big matches, say, on Dynamite, or, you know, and that's what happened there. And he's wrestled a lot on Dark and a lot on Elevation. So he's always on the outside looking in. If they can get him up to a certain point where they feel like they feel confident with Lance Archer, they could always shine him up and make him a title contender, or they could have him be part of a feud if they decide to do that down the line you know that could be something they could consider okay let me look at malachi black i'm gonna pull him up real quick malachi black's record 2021 is when he started he's a record is five and two so in one tag team match which was the one that he worked with andrade a little at full gear they lost but otherwise he's five and one because he lost one time to cody rhodes in a in the uh, like a best out of three feud that they had, which is continuing on. So even with Cody taking a loss to Malachi Black, the overall part is he's not hurt by it. Plus, he's booked so well because he's only working Dynamite and Rampage. He didn't even put him on. They don't even put him on uh, Dark and the Dark Elevation. He doesn't even work those shows. But look at that record; it's strong. If I look at Andrade El Idolo, and you look at what he's done. Let me show you his record. In his part, his record in 2021, five and two, same thing as Malachi Black. Five and one is a single star, and I forget which match uh, that he had where he lost, but, you know, that's all there is to it. And you look at what they do, and with him, he works Dynamite, he'll work Rampage. He's done some work on Dark and Elevation this week, but they're putting him on Dark and Elevation because they're padding his record to make him better. So like if not for dark and elevation matches where he's being done strong and he's working some big squash matches, right? Then his record gets to be not three and one, but five and one. 
And if he keeps working shows like that, you're just going to see his record just amass. So when he comes up against somebody and then you see the graphic as he comes out for Dynamite or Rampage, his record's gotten better, right? That's what you're looking at. Even with, you know, some stars you think it would be built in. I mean, you look at what they're doing with that. I mean, what other stars can I think of right here that I could really use as a example? Okay, Dante Martin is another example. Another young star on the rise. And even with him, his record right now, 28 and 15. So he's definitely mid card, but he's, you know, his record has been pretty solid. 28 and 20 and eight and eight right now so far. But they're also padding his show as well because while he's lost on Rampage and he's lost and he hasn't, uh, he probably lost some matches on Dynamite. With him, he's had 12 matches on Dark, six on Elevation. And he's working other things. So, like, there's part of that, too. And they're talking about how the fact in, in the matches sometimes where he's been in tag or trios matches, he's pinned the, opponent, pinned the opponent three times or he has taken a pin three times. Things like that. So, like, there's parts where, you know, if it's not a single star on the rise, that's where you have that. I could go along all, on and on about this. Daniel Garcia, I could do the same thing. I could go through all this all night and record for hours and tell you how this works out. So with him, you know, did you see it? Seven and seven. It's not great, but he's had also a lot of matches when it comes. He's six and six on uh, singles matches and all that. I could go on and on and I'm going to stop right there. I'll give you the one best example. Okay. Cody Rhodes. We always talk about, right? About, oh, he's got the nepotism. He's got, you know, the, he runs the book and whatever. He's got the inside track. Do you know what Cody Rhodes record right now? Overall, 45 wins, 15 losses overall on AEW, right? 2021 record, 14 and 7. So he's been 10 and 4 as a single star, 4 and 2 in tag. If I'm looking at, you know, what he's done for his matches, he's done 20 on Dynamite. He's worked dark twice. He's had his matches on pay-per-view and a house show win. So he's working a lot. His record doesn't even come close to the rest of those stars I mentioned. He's nothing like the Pillars. Not even the free agents have been brought on board, right? Because we know Daniel Bryan, or to me, Brian Danielson and CM Punk are undefeated coming into things. But that tells you everything. WWE is not worried about records. They're not worrying about the feuds. Don't worry about the storylines. They're going to just book shows. Get stars they're going to bring back if they want to for part-time effort and make them somewhere it's going to be something big and important to go and talk about. And that's what they're going to do. That's what matters to them. And they're going to just try to work in new stars from NXT, which hopefully that's going to start paying off a little bit because the ratings are starting to go down. They've dropped below the benchmark of 600,000 viewers this week. And, you know, it's the show's going to be tough. Like, you are you are filling for time on NXT as well. Like, that poker showdown segment with Duke Hudson and uh, Cameron Grimes, we got the payoff for it because they wanted to go ahead and cut the hair and to create that feud. But that poker showdown thing went for a while, and they stretched that thing out as much as they could. And you had other matches and other things were going on that were building up to. It's not like the show's horrible to watch, but it is long. And... These stars they have at NXT have to matter because we have to hope that they're going to be strongly built to the point that, and then what's happening right now is that's what they're doing. There's a lot of glorified squash matches for some of these stars, like it's a Zion Quinn or what is it? The Usos uh, cousin that's in there now. I forget his name. CeeLo. Uh, oh, I forgot his name now. I forget. But you're looking at that. You're looking at, the way they're booking Braun Breaker or Toxic Attraction, who you know eventually they're going to look at some of these stars and they're going to put them over to the main roster eventually because they have no choice. And there will be some stars that might still get let go from you know releases, things like that going on down the line. We don't know, but we can always expect that to happen. And that's what they're going to continue to do. So, as I as I just try to put this all together in perspective, WWE right now, they're probably trying to get away from the importance of TV shows. 
They have to put something on TV. So as long as they're putting matches out there, for the most part, they're putting good matches, but they are stretching out and filling for time. And they're not putting anything of real emphasis there unless they're booking towards the pay-per-view. And it's not just any other pay-per-view that could be on Peacock. They're going to book for the shows with bigger, where they can make a big event and they can make a big take on the event for merchandise. They can make a big take for the crowds are going to get there for these big stadium shows they are going to plan next year. That's the extra part of what they're going to do. Plus, if they're able to put these big shows out there and look, hey, WWE at the at the level of, say, the NFL, we can do what NASCAR does. We can do what NFL does. We can do what Major League Baseball does. We can pack stadiums at any time of the year. We can do that. You want to bring us for Fourth of July weekend for Labor Day, you know, that's what they can do, and that's what they're trying. And then Super Bowl weekend with Royal Rumble, that's what they're going to try to do. And you know, they're not even worrying about booking gimmick pay per views anymore. There's only a handful of those now. We don't have Elimination Chamber. We didn't have a TLC. We probably won't even have a Hell in a Cell next year. So those kind of things are gone by the wayside. Not even getting a fast lane. And then what they're doing is they're also booking events and spreading them out. So like the ramp from Royal Rumble to WrestleMania, you have what one pay-per-view leading up to that. And that's it. You know, after survivor series, you're not doing, you're not doing the December pay-per-view of TLC that that show's not even around because what they're going to do is instead of having these gimmick pay-per-views, now they're going to use the gimmicks for matches as they did initially. They're going to probably use a TLC match when necessary. They'll do a Hell in a Cell match when necessary. They'll do an Elimination Chamber match if and when necessary. They want to do whatever, casket matches. They want to do, you know, steel cage. They can do whatever they want. But now those matches are going to start become special against because they're not going to be just dedicated to a pay-per-view, except for certain ones where Money the Bank is going to get a, now not just a standalone where the gimmick pay-per-view continues. Now it's going to get elevated even higher because now they're putting in a big stadium and they're making a big deal out of that. So now they want to push around July 4th weekend and they want to put in Las Vegas. They want to put a lot of people in the seats. And then right around Labor Day weekend, they want to have that show in the UK and really build that up too. And then the Saudi Arabia shows, we already know they're trying to build shows just as big as they normally would have put here. Like, Everybody kept talking about Crown Jewel. That thing was booked like a WrestleMania, how big that was. And they're right. And that's what they're trying to do. So it's a different mindset. We don't know what it completely is yet. We're not sure. But it does make a lot of sense of what they're doing and how they're setting things up. But they need to be worried. WWE really is there making attempts. They are trying to do things. There's one story I want to bring up before we wrap up. It's a stock website story from The Motley Fool, which is a pretty credible website when it comes down to it. They put a story out where they said, and this is the problem that WWE is worrying about, is that they have to win the war in the press. It's not the war of the ratings between their competition. Like the little Friday Night War thing we had for a couple weeks during the World Series, that doesn't matter. And what these shows are doing individually You know, as long as they're not going after each other head to head, the ratings will be considered and what they're going to be doing will be considered. Now, we're in the Tony Khan's beginning a lot of press right now, speaking to say that the folks of Variety are doing a lot of different interviews and talking regularly. So he's out there as the face of the company and not necessarily the other stars really taking so much of the point of that. So like AW is on the offensive trying to get the publicity out there being put on different shows and just trying to get noticed. But what's happening is, you know, now you're having the business types that are the stories that they're writing are geared towards the shareholders of WWE. They're basically, they're messing with the WWE shareholders and saying, do we want to keep their stock? And that's what people are worried about. So they have to think about that. And this is where it's manipulation of the stock. Wall Street could do what they want, and WWE has to go and be able to keep their shareholders happy and make sure that what's being said in the press, which is on purpose being done to stimulate some talk 
and to create some buzz for AEW just for the purpose of making WWE do more to make more money, right? That's how they're doing it. So Motley, Motley Fool talks about this, and they say here, so I'm, I'm going to go through some of the things that we already know, and I'm going to just go through some of the things that matter here. So some key points you're saying is that All Elite Wrestling, which they've definitely mo- mentioned in the story, isn't the just taking WWE's leftovers, it's playing hardball. WWE seems to think its fans want to see the same matches over and over again. WWE needed a deep bench to replace the talent that has left. Unfortunately, the company seems content to rely on fewer stars. So, quote, in business, competition is never as healthy as total domination. That's a quote from Peter Lynch from his uh, book, One Up on Wall Street, warning that WWE investors should heed. They've had a 20-year reign as a preeminent sports entertainment brand, but now they face real competition for talent and viewers. It's just Wall Street saying this now. So regardless of what people want to say in the IWC and how you want to talk, mainstream Wall Street stock markets, the investor class, they're calling AW competition. That's important, and that matters. Regardless of what you all of you think, if you're, you know, if you're bitter or you're angry or you just have a resentment towards AEW because you're just that much of a WWE fan, well, the business world where money matters, it this does matter to them and it makes a sense. And they say that because there's real competition for talent and viewers from upstart rival All Elite Wrestling, it could spell the end of WWE's dominant stock performance. Yep. So they talk about that. Now they make mention of this. Many wrestlers, wrestlers get into the business around age 20, given the wear and tear of their bodies. Many of those stay active much past 40. And at first, AW only seemed to attract older former WWE stars who were past their prime. The narrative seems to be changing. Since the end of 2019, 23 top male stars and 12 male stars have been left or been cut by WWE and attempted to replace them are 14 new male stars and essentially three new female stars. Now, they go along and talk about that the WWE's creative team seems to be confusing its fans with a plan for future talent as well. Many of the recent roster cuts came from rookies the company just promoted to their biggest shows, Raw and SmackDown. Bringing along rookies, promoting them, and just firing them doesn't seem like decision-making investors should embrace. WWE does have a 90-day non-compete clause, so we don't know yet who else will land with AEW. But... Executive Tony Khan has openly expressed an interest in a few people, he says. Then they talk about over the last five years, shares for WWE have increased at a compound annual growth, but investors are hoping for a repeat performance from the from the stock, which means the investors expect a return on their profit for as long as they're holding their stock. So they always have to keep making profit. That's just a corporate way. That's why these stockholders are holding on to the stock because it's going to keep making money for them. And it never drops. So you have the media rights deals that have helped out. Media revenue represents nearly 80% of the top total line of WWE because that's where the most of their money is being made. 80% of the broadcast deals. So the media rights contracts are set amounts for the TV rights over a number of years, providing revenue stability, but could also lead to a big win or big disappointment when these contracts renew. So the creative team now leads. It can do just fine by rerunning the same matches. Brandon Thurston of WrestleNomics found the first six months of 2021, 39% of WWE's main roster were involved in rematches, even the headliners at pay-per-view events. On the other hand, AEW's rematch percentage was just 4%. And now, AEW's novelty is helping it draw on viewers. So on the October 29th broadcast for WWE Raw and AEW Dynamite, they nearly held identical viewership in the coveted 18 to 49 year old demographic. They go and talk about COVID and they make the point at the end here where there are two issues for investors to face. First is their profit and equity ratio is higher than last year. The stock price has increased though. The company's fundamentals seem to be deteriorating and hedge funds have seemed to have lost interest over the last year because that's just, Hedge funds are just big investors that hold on to numerous companies. And now the amount of hedge funds that were actually involved that have a whole lot of money behind it, 
they're now holding less or no WWE stock, which is important. So AEW isn't going to sit around and let the WWE have all the fun. WWE had a good run over the last five years, but the next five, next few years look challenging at best, and that investors should consider avoiding the stock until management could come up with a game plan for first serious competition in two decades. This is the lay of the land, ladies and gentlemen. We know now what the WWE way of booking, presenting, promoting their shows is right now, whether we like it or we don't like it. We know what AEW is doing, and the momentum is on their side. The new wrestling alliance is no longer what it is. Everybody since the pandemic now has kind of gone on through their own thing. Impact is on their own agenda, except for the fact that Japan and Mexico promotions are still working within for Impact Wrestling and AEW and MLW and other organizations. That's where we are now. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for listening in, finding this show, subscribing to it. Check out the website, wrestlingisreal.com, where you can find all my past episodes. And you can get all the latest news. It's also there. It's a great little spot to go and check out at least a couple times a week. So go ahead and do that. Tell more people about the show. And please put a rate and review for me. I got my birthday coming up next week, and I'll be broadcasting probably that night leading up to it. I'll be at my birthday's on Thanksgiving Day. One of the best Thanksgiving presents you could do for me this year, or the best birthday presents you could do for me this year, is to please rate and review on Apple Podcasts, please, and leave a review on there and on Amazon Music or Audible, if you'll do that for me. If you're not already subscribed there, please subscribe. Best birthday present I could get. I hope all of you will consider that. And please tell a friend to tell a friend. Come back this Sunday. I like I'm not even going to do predictions for Survivor Series. I'm just going to leave it there because it doesn't really matter. But I will do a post show Survivor Series this Sunday after it happens. So make sure to go and check out WrestlingGoesWorld.com. Come back for that. If you don't catch it on WrestlingGoesWorld.com, then please go to my YouTube channel, youtubecom slash jbrasco 951 Come back this Sunday after Survivor Series for another Wrestling Is Real podcast because wrestling needs us thank you for listening to the wrestling is real podcast you can find all previous episodes at wrestlingisreal.com or subscribe to the show on all major podcast outlets including apple amazon google spotify and iHeartRadio. follow the king of podcasts on twitter facebook and instagram at king of podcasts and search king of podcasts on youtube or type youtube.com slash jbrasco951. This has been a presentation of the King of Podcasts Radio Network.